Hey guys, Anthony 4 Before Diesel. Just going to talk to you a little bit and hopefully give you a bit of ev education, not ev evocation, education, education on diff lockers, okay? So um, we're not necessarily promoting any particular brand of lockers. We're going to run through all the pros and cons of our experiences, what we know, and we don't know everything, and there's certainly more people that have got more experiences with these, so hopefully they're uh, sharing as well. Of course they are. Um, people are asking questions like, do I need lockers? Um, are they going to be, you know, are they going to be helpful? So it all depends which vehicle, and it depends where you're going to use it. So these are the sort of things we're going to cover, and obviously this vehicle does have a ARB compressor fitted, which we do like. Happy to give that a plug, the ARB compressor. Not so good these switches, right? They can break easily, they, they're a bit, how you going, right? Um, but, that being said, I don't think that means they break all the time. I'm just saying they're a bit, they'd be better off to have those other sort of, you know, like a, that sort of switch, all right? Not these, you know, this one, mm, yeah. Just not that, it, they're not broken, but they just seem a bit, yeah. I'm not a fan of the switches, but the, ARB compressor, absolutely, and this has got a front locker in it. So we're going to talk about what brand of lockers, when you need them, when you don't, how they help you, and on some vehicles how they don't necessarily help you. So let's find something else to have a look at while we do that, eh? Okay, so like always, there's a whole heap of different information I can include and not include. This isn't scripted. We're quite happy to make a few mistakes where I call a spanner a ratchet and a ratchet a spanner and a screwdriver a hammer and vice versa you'll notice that a little bit hopefully you figure out know what I mean I've just threw it and just dropped the wrong word every now and then completely the wrong word but anyway this is the ARB compressor as I already said we're really happy with that this one's been in this vehicle for I keep saying I think I think it's all about five years old this vehicle with us and all the gear it's all about five years old 2014 anyway so what are we now 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Come, look, it's about to be six years old, okay? So, um, so just quickly, ARB are probably one of the most popular, popular, a bit like BFG tyres, you know, we talk about the BFG KOs and the KO2s and the OME suspension. Well, the compressors are probably one of the most popular compressor now. There's gazillions of others out there as well, and I'm not telling you which one's better or not, but I'm happy with this one. And this is what we're putting into the 150 Prado. We've got one there just waiting for that bracket from Kaon. And of course, that's basically what we'd recommend if you asked, depending if it suits your conditions, depending on space in the vehicle, which one you go for, the single or the double pump, or whether you get a portable one, whether you've got room for that or not. For us, I always say touring, maximizing space in the vehicle, we need our batteries and compressors down here under the bonnet. So. Just a basic rundown, with the ARB lockers, um, we'll talk about a little bit, you do need air to run those, so they're not electronic, electric operated, well they kind of are by the switch that operates the compressor, which operates the air. So basically this is a mini tank here, that's got air pressure in it, there's a little um, solenoid pressure switch there we'll call it, right, which says okay stop, well hopefully it does, because if it doesn't you might have problems, but no that's what it does. and. Here we've got a solenoid that when you flick that, so one switch is switching the compressor on and the other switch is activating this solenoid for the locker which has got the airline which runs out here. You probably can't see a lot, it's got corrugated split tubing over it to help protect it. Um, that's the compressor that I think is good value for money. Uh, it does the job to pump up the tyre, it doesn't take too long as long as you've got it set up right. And um, that's what I mean is with without lengthening the wires, once you lengthen the wires, voltage drop, distance in the vehicle, have all the accessories off, have the engine running, have it as close as possible to the battery without extending the wire and really good connections, and it pumps, it goes for it, right? You're looking at about, from your average air down off-road pressure to back to full pressure, I think it's about 70 to 80 seconds of tyre as, you know, I sort of just stand there. I don't use the gauge, I don't want to stand there bent over holding a button, I just use the pump-up kit. I clip it on, I've got my pencil gauge in my hand, bit of a chit chat with the next guy for a minute and then I'll go down and check it and just about every time I'm above 35 nearly 40 I'm aiming for about 40 usually depending what car and whether it's front or rear so and then just a quick adjustment and bada bing so that's the compressor 
As I said, air is required to operate these lockers. We won't go into too much detail of the operation. It's more whether you need them or not, what vehicle and front or rear and um, yeah, yeah, and all that sort of thing. So let's kind of stick to Prado, okay? So, and similar vehicles. So Prado, it's got a, generally, yeah, the Prado, I'm just thinking, as I say, the Prado's got a, a live axle in the rear, okay? So live axle and they've got independent suspension in the front. And I suppose this is a problem if you're one of the people that doesn't understand all of this and you're watching to learn. These terms uh, could be a bit complicated, but a lot of people know what I mean, so it's hard to cater for everyone. So as I always say, subscribe, keep watching all the other videos, and there'll be more coming, and it'll all sort of come together slowly. So I'll try to paint a picture for you like this firstly. So you've got your Prado, and let's call it a 120 Prado this time because this is going to vary again, even just sticking to Prado kind of thing or anything like it. So if, if the things I say are the same on another vehicle, it's probably about the same information. So we're going to deal with a 120 Prado, which is independent front suspension, and it's got an LSD, limited slip diff in the rear, and um, that pretty much covers it, okay? So you've got a live axle in the rear, which is limited slip diff. Now, when you're going up a hill, because you've got a live axle with the right suspension set up, you've got quite a fair bit of travel, so your wheels generally can stay on the ground better. Of course, you're going up the hill, so all the weight transfers to the, not all, shouldn't say all, a lot of the weight transfers to the rear of the vehicle. Okay, so um, you can try and test that theory. You can work out how to do it, but um, I don't know. Go and stand on the mud in one foot, right? Go and stand in some mud on one foot, and get your other foot and just touch it lightly and see, you know, all the weight's on one foot. There you go. It's not a very good example, is it? But wh whichever end the weight's on, you know, and a hill obviously is lowering, you know, so that all the weight's gone that way. There I go. I said it all, but it's not all. Um, most of, depending on the angle, right? And there's probably some mathematics, scientific calculation, which I haven't even thought about introducing that to this video until then. But you could do that and tell you exactly how much weight of three tons gone to the rear on however many degree angle, 20 degree angle, right? I'll put it out there that on a 30 degree angle, you've probably got, I don't know, 2200 kilos on the rear and 800 on the front. There you go. That's just a rough estimate. And there's someone out there with a pen that just wrote that down that's a math physics expert and they're going to work it out and hopefully put a reply there and tell me how far in or out I was anyway. So but I just estimated and guessed. Now, with that understood, you've got a live axle. That means a solid axle, right? It's one piece. It's not independent suspension. It's not as limited as independent suspension. We'll get to that. We're not fully explaining independent and live axle. It's more about lockers, but I'm just gonna to touch on this a little bit, right? So you're going up a hill, you've got a live or solid axle. It can flex up and down, stretch its legs right out with the right setup, you know, nice long travel shockers without damaging brake lines or anything else, do you know what I mean? Just the right amount, like the Dobinson's rears. And then, you know, when it compresses, you know, the wheel pushes right up there. So you've got, you know, let's just, again, put it out there, a couple hundred mil of travel. Now, because you've got a LSD, limited slip diff, inside there, because you're going up the hill, you've got quite a lot of pressure on your accelerator, on the gas through the drive line, keeping that, that diff kind of locked. It's not locked, it's limited slip but it's at this point probably keeping it locked. So that works really well. Now the problem is you're going up the hill and the weights come off the front of the vehicle. And what happens there is that your springs kind of extend because there's not a lot of weight on them and it doesn't take much of a change in that surface of the track to lift a wheel, okay? So just think of it, you're tilted right back there, all the weights on the back, there's not much weight on the front and let's dig a little hole under one of them because they're like really the springs almost to its full extension because the hill's that steep and if we dig a little bit out under one of them say even two inches right that's 50 mil 60 mil 70 mil somewhere there you're almost that that wheel's going to drop into that the weight's on the back of the car remember so there's only takes one other tire at the front to sort of keep the car balanced so one's on the ground as soon as there's a slight hole there that wheel's off the ground and even if it's not off the ground there's not much pressure on it pushing it to the ground to keep your driving forward because you thought you had a four wheel drive and what you've just learnt now is you've kind of got a rear wheel drive because you're, you're going up that hill and as soon as that ground level's not even you lose traction at one of your front wheels as I said no weight on it, there's a hole there, I hope you're with me so far okay 
and then it spins. What happens? So in the vehicle at the front, you've got what's like an open deer for it. There's no LSD, there's no limited slip. You kind of need to play with cars a bit to get what I mean. Go and play with the diff. Go down the wreckers or something, spin a diff and see how one, you know, one wheel turns one way, one turns the other, and you know, and what happens. Basically, once you lose traction at one side, let's just say it's the left front that has a bit of a hole there, that wheel just immediately spins. All the power goes to that wheel, okay? And your other wheel gets no drive whatsoever. So your, your front's not pulling you up the hill anymore. You've got nothing. You've just lost a massive amount of drive. So you've got a rear wheel drive vehicle pushing you up the hill, which usually works because as we said, you've got the LSD and you've got the flex. Now where you come to a problem is, at the same point as that front, there's a hole we said under the left hand front, didn't we I think? Or do we say, it doesn't matter. Offset to that, you've got a hole at the rear, but it's a massive hole, okay? More than what the vehicle can flex. And what same thing, it's a whole lot better than the front, but once that wheel, one's really compressed and the other one's the spring stretched out and it hasn't got much pressure on the ground anymore, that's where that LSD cracks loose. And some people say, oh, the Toyota LSDs are crap or whatever they say. No, they're not crap, that's not what I see. They're actually really good, but we're not gonna argue about that. We've seen some damn good ones. We've seen cars on the tracks, including this one right here, with all four wheels spinning with the LSD. No traction, it's all over the place. The front lock is on, all four wheels are spinning. That LSD stays locked, and plenty of other experiences over the years. We think the LSDs are okay. Obviously, subject to how they've been looked after with all changes and driving, okay? You can wear them out, and of course you can get them shimmed up so they work a bit better. And there's a few options, we're gonna to get to that. So I hope you understand that so far. Now, by putting a locker in the rear, it's gonna pr pretty much solve your problem for, for that track, if you know what I mean, for that track. But when you get to something a little bit harder, um, let me just take one step back. So putting it in the rear is probably gonna solve your problem, okay? But it's, go it's gonna get you up the hill. If you put the locker in the front, it's definitely gonna solve your problem because the front's locked, You've got your LSD working really well. It was working a lot better than the front because the weight's on it and the LSD was working. And if we could keep the front working with the rear, then that would just pull it over that momentary couple of inches in distance where that LSD broke loose. So you've virtually got a dual locked four wheel drive. You haven't, but virtually almost by having a front locker in this example of vehicle, okay? So, if you were to put the rear locker in and then continue up the hill and then you got to a really rocky rough bit where you're really stretching your legs, it's going to come to a point where you need a four wheel drive because all you've got is a rear wheel drive. You've put the rear locker in, so you've locked the rear, so that's cool but you haven't done anything about the front. So you've still only got a two wheel drive at the rear, right? I hope you're with me with this. Now once you get to that rougher part of the track further up, that's where you want your four wheel drive. And by having the front locker instead of the rear in this a lot of vehicles I'll say, but it's not always. I think there's gonna be cases where a rear locker works better, but not many. You really need to understand the operation of these vehicles, and that's why I'm trying to explain it in detail. And I hope you can get your head around it. I hope I'm doing an okay job. So we're further up the hill. Instead of, okay, we got the, we got the rear locker, and we get to this really rocky bit. Same sort of thing happens, but you're just spinning both your rear wheels. You haven't got traction, it's steep, it's rocky, and the front's just doing nothing. The front's on the ground, or at least one of them is, but it's doing nothing. One's spinning, the other one's got no drive sort of thing, right? So, what's going on there? You know, things not happen, And then, you know, so it sort of helps cause your rear to spin as well. So, you've got a center diff lock as well. That locks the front to the rear. That's just going to confuse things a bit more. We'll do that in a separate video, or I hope you understand how that works already, right? So, trying to keep this simple towards around lockers. So, going up the hill, you've got to the rough bit. The rear... It's on the ground, it's locked, and you know, you can't get traction, you're not getting up the hill, and your front's doing nothing. Now let's turn it around the other way. Let's not have put the locker in the rear, let's put the locker in the front. Because remember what we said, the front, it's got limited travel because it's IFS, okay? There's not anywhere near as much weight on it because the car's going up the hill on a 30 degree angle, 25, 30 degrees average, most tracks are about 25, 30 degrees, you know? Little peaks go over that, but if someone tells you it's 40, 45, they're just dreaming, mate, you know what I mean? They roll down the hill. If they tell you that, they'll be bringing you their car parts in a bucket or something, what's left of it, okay? Tracks are around about 25 to 30 degrees generally. If you've got that locker in the front, the front's locked, 
The rear is also most likely on the ground and it's got LSD and it's just working and the car crawls up the track. And what the beautiful part about it is though, you haven't actually got both ends locked so you can steer a little bit and you can momentarily unlock and lock that front locker to make sure you've got your steering and back on again. It just works really well. So this vehicle here, we had the front locker in this before the rear locker went in. It worked awesomely. It just transformed the whole vehicle. This is just not my experience. I've spoken to a lot of other clients and people that have told me how good it is with that front locker. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people that tell me how good it is with their rear locker, but they, they just sort of don't get it because they haven't done it with the front locker instead. You know, do it the other way around and you'll just understand how it's like five times better. You know, that's again a guess. It's not a scientific measurement. It's a guesstimate. Is, there, is that a real word? But anyway, that's what I mean, whatever. So you've got the front locker in and up you go is basically the way it works. No weight on the front, open diff, wheel spinner, no, all of a sudden it's a front pulling it up and the rear pushing it up because you've got the LSD and the flex. And even if that LSD breaks loose at some point, it's only a momentary thing. And you can help your LSD work by applying brakes and handbrakes and stuff like that to put a bit more load on it. So, but we're not gonna go into that too much. I just wanted to explain about kind of how, firstly, how the locker transforms the car. And then, we're just looking at the compressor. It's pretty boring, isn't it? It's not about what we're looking at. You know, we're not gonna pull diffs out and show you, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's, I'm explaining to you. So I hope you get what I mean. That's the deal. Now, obviously, or well, not so obviously, if it's a 150 Prado, it's completely, well maybe not completely, but it's very different because a 150 Prado doesn't have LSD in the rear is the first part, okay, because it's got traction control, okay, traction control. Um, so it doesn't have an LSD. So you're kind of disadvantaged from the point that you don't start off with an LSD, but what you have got, you've got a sophisticated computer there that senses the speed of the wheels and as you're heading up those tracks as long as you haven't turned the traction control off because some tracks you do need to do that in sand that's another video another time if i haven't mentioned already we've got another channel that explains a lot more of the driving stuff and we're going to get more into that it's not called four before diesel it's called four before touring australia okay f-o-u-r-b-y number four touring and then space australia four before touring australia if you can't find the channel just search crazy snow trip or crazy snow drive and if you see a picture of i don't know the prados in the snow whatever that's the one it's got, it starts with crazy and it's got a picture of you know the snow cold emblem thing i'll put that in the picture that's from last winter anyway so that was a pretty popular video check that out and we're going to get better you know like this channel we're going to get better just trying to help you and share the information but we're not going to put too much of the touring stuff on this channel because people probably want to be more mechanical and this is borderline because this is to do with driving and mechanical so might even end up on both channels. Anyway, we'll see. Back to it. Locker, where was I? Traction control. So when you've got traction control, you're going up any of those tracks. Soon as one wheel spins, you've got your open diff, so the wheels can break loose and spin fairly easy, depending what sort of setup, suspension, tires and all that, and driving what line you pick. But let's just say a wheel starts spinning, straight away that computer, we call it a computer, keeping it simple, says, hey, that wheel spinning and it applies the brakes, right? So it's taking wheel speed measurements and it does its thing and it applies the brakes to stop that wheel spinning. As soon as it stops that wheel spinning, then you get drive back to your other wheels because while that, remember what we said, same with the 120, when that, when that front wheel spins, for example, you lose drive to the other side. When the brakes come on and stop wheel spinning, you get drive back to the rest of the car. So in a 150 Prado, so I hope everybody's still watching, even if you didn't want lockers because there's a bit of how to drive here. In a 150 Prado, when you're going up a hill and you come to a harder section and whatever, it's all about practice and smooth and the correct tire pressures and setup of the vehicle, but it's all about also keeping on the gas. Don't back off because it can't do its job if you back off. If you spin a wheel, right, but you've got to be careful. You don't want to be jumping in the air, spinning wheels and coming down hard and you've just got to be, so there's a whole, you need to kind of see how it's done, but hopefully you understand this, right? So. Track control pretty well does the job. Now, let me explain to you this way. Say a 120 Prado or a 150 Prado with lockers is gonna be the far superior vehicle, okay? If you're doing the hardest tracks you can find, okay? Because you want those wheels locked. When you're going up a rough, loose track, you're picking your line, 
you need those wheels, all four locked straight away is the best way you can be if you want to get up at first go. Because sometimes it's a matter of, remember those bits and pieces you're picking up in a bucket, taking it home, what's left? That's how it could end up if you don't get it right the first time on some of these tracks. So lockers are definitely the best, okay? Now 150 Prado's traction control, it's not far off it. It's going to do 99% of all the same tracks. It's probably going to get the job done anyway. There's some tracks it's not going to get done if you haven't got lockers, right? But it's going to do it a lot smoother. So it's an 80% thing as far as smoothness goes. So 80% of the time, you're going to get it done, but 20% of the time it's going to be a bit rough. You're going to bounce around. It's going to go and put stress on your CVs and splines on your drive shafts and all sorts of things, right? Where if you had the lockers, it's just smooth all the way. It's already locked, okay? I hope you understand what I mean with that. So traction control is really good. In my opinion, on a 150 Prado, you don't need lockers, right? You're nuts because if you want to go and do tracks that your traction control can't do on a 150 Prado with a well set up vehicle, and a good driver with some experience, some training and experience, working your way up to those tracks. If you can't get it done, and you need to go and put lockers in a 150 Prado, I think that you've got the wrong vehicle. Perhaps you know, you maybe you needed, you know, like a patrol, something with live axles, a hundred series or whatever that you can get a better lift and tires, and you know, get your lockers front and rear and all that sort of thing. Certainly, okay, you're probably thinking, yeah, but I like the Prado and the Comfort and all that. So by all means, you can do that. I understand that. We don't want to complain. Oh, but you know, I get it. it, it Circumstances different for everyone. I'm trying to put a general thing out there for people. So in my opinion, you don't need lockers in a 150 Prado, okay? And that's kind of it. That's it. And if I was to put one in, would I put front or rear? That's confusing because I just wouldn't put one in. So I'm not going to answer that one. Now in a 120 Prado or something that hasn't got traction control, Definitely I put in a front locker and there's a number of reasons for that. We explain how well it works The second one is the diff is mounted solid. It's not moving So there's less chance you're gonna have any problems with airlines or wires. Okay, so they're operated by either a wire or an airline You know, you can get the e-lockers. Okay, you can get other brands of lockers as well. I'm not really here to talk about brands um, The ARV ones, you know, as far as I know, unless it's changed, they've got a five-year warranty, which is pretty good and that's probably because traditionally there was a lot of issues with those little seals leaking, whatever, you know what I mean? And there's been, there's been different reasons given, you know, people using the wrong oil or fit munitions or whatever. I don't really care. Make it easier so there's no problems, make it reliable. But hopefully they did, but the main thing they did, they put a five year warranty on it. Now, this one, you know how old it is, we're not gonna say it again, zero problems, okay? So, I don't know. I know other people with front lockers like this vehicle, same locker, that have had problems, and I know people that have got lock like this generally don't have problems. So fairly reliable. There's only one we know that's had a problem with the front locker. Um, there's been a number of people all over the internet and that have had problems with a rear one, which is another reason to probably leave your rear LSD alone until you get that oil leak at the pinion seal, which will come eventually. And then because you're doing the seal, you just do the bearings and you just do the whole diff center and sort it out. And you know what? You might as well do your rear axle bearings as well, because eventually we're talking, you know, three or four hundred thousand Ks or something like that. Not, you know, anything urgent. Just while you're there, you just do it and your whole diff's redone for another three or four hundred thousand Ks or longer. All right. So lockers, we've explained kind of, you know, the advantages and how they work. Now, let's go through a few different terrains. I'm going to have a rest for a minute and then, because it's all just off the top of my head, I think I'm getting a, my brain's overheating. Give me a sec. Okay, since we're talking about terrain and where you might use the vehicle, I figure we might as well look at a terrain map. I should have probably got a pointer, didn't I? Hang on, I've got a fishing rod over here. Oh, no, I've got an antenna. Lucky you've got these handy things. Here we go, look at this. And over here, we have Alice Springs. The weather today in Alice Springs is probably about 28 degrees. Anyway, we're not doing the weather. Map of Australia, and down here, sorry you can't see the map of Tassie, but we had to sort of make sure you couldn't see the map of Tassie. No, no, it just didn't fit in the picture. Now, bada bing, right? Depending where you're gonna be. Locker, where do you need a locker? Okay, so, see this area here, where all these hills are? Could be steep and rough terrain in places, okay? You know, I'm just thinking about, this is not pre-scripted, pre-planned, and I'm gonna go as far as to say, you know, these sort of areas down here in Tassie, where there's hills and ruts and rough tracks, like in the high, look, you don't need a locker in the high country, generally, some tracks, this is the problem you've got with tracks, right? 
when they're drying they're wet totally two different things so just do it when it's dry get to know your tracks don't go to the crappy ones in the wet better for your vehicle because you can have a locker and just bust your diff or something you know pros and cons people say oh no it saves you from busting diffs that's right that's the information they put out there if you can crawl it and do it slowly and gently it may just save your diff that's a good point totally agree with that but then it can put a lot of pressure on there as well because you put push yourself to go and do harder tracks i'm not going to name anywhere but there's a place over here starting with p and if you know what i'm talking about or i want to see in the comments tell me what it's called it's just over here somewhere right you know just over there um, and it's got some really steep hills and steep tracks and quite rough in places and once you start pushing yourself to the harder tracks that's where you're loading up the drive line anyway so it's always a risk if you don't mind risk and breaking stuff go for it you know put the lockers in and hit the hardest tracks you can hit me in the comments i might even reply and tell you where to go i might tell you where to go too anyway um the rougher tracks is where you want lockers okay generally you don't need them look i'll just think about the trips we do the vehicles that come along and some vehicles haven't got lockers and some drivers amaze me obviously they've got some skills or some experience or some luck because we'll come to a track and i'll go oh, here we go i might just maybe i'm getting lazy i'll flick the locker on for this one you drive straight up or you drive up and it wasn't straight up it was a, yeah, a bit of a yeah i wonder and then you sort of go oh, i wonder how he's going to go without the locker and you get out and you get your camera ready and they just drive straight up it's like wow prados anyway so i said the right setup the right tires tire pressures bit of experience take your time to pick the right line this is not driver training but don't panic and rush in and worry about keeping up the car in front of you they, they need to wait for you you need to stop look think think about what worked last time you didn't take a minute you know take a breath relax make sure you're in the right gears and everything bada bing okay so do i need lockers maybe around there but i don't i can't think of anywhere above there that you need lockers but i haven't been everywhere so what would i know um you know if you're going up the cape well there's a few areas up here on this you know the otl where a locker will help now i reckon in the right conditions you probably do it without a locker you shouldn't be doing it on your own so you've got a mate in front of you that can pull you up if you don't make it or you know because i don't really think you need a winch either if you do it right well you know we got through everything um no locker needed no winching or anything like that needed so it's not that hard if you take your time pick your line right so um up there no no locker needed coming down here yeah no lockers anywhere that i know of um you know a lot of these places close to places like brisbane and that they're all there's a lot of you know glass house mountains whatever we'll just call it there's a lot of pig pen places whether it's brisbane sydney melbourne whatever it's these places you just don't want to go adelaide's pretty cool because you know there's not really anything that hard it's all dry you know it's a dry estate you know it's all dry and rocky and grippy and you know and the flinders ranges and that around here wherever it is up there somewhere you know i'm just giving a general bit of a what <laughs> um all these hard tracks like sky trek and you know whatever they're just you don't need a locker but don't get me wrong you may struggle a little bit without one depending on the condition of the track where the holes are what line you pick now um that that one billy goats as well up there um the way it is now i would suggest not going up billy goats or probably that new hard track what's it called they put in i'd probably suggest not doing those they're up here somewhere right i'm not getting right in i'll get my head in the way of the the map here you know in there somewhere anyway they're, they're about here somewhere um you know i wouldn't suggest going in there without a locker but you could depends if you go in there and you've got to go and do the hardest tracks there now if you're going to go on fraser island or something like that over here some people are thinking do i need a locker well you don't because sand lockers aren't much help really and they can be a bit hindrance if you've got to turn so the idea is it's not a sand driving training video but if you've got to turn the idea in sand is to stay on top right so when you turn you dig the sharper you turn the more you dig so you want to make gentle turns right low pressure stay on top do it all gently a little bit of momentum just depending on the whole circumstances um, by having a locker remember when you're turning one side wants to catch up with the other it's locked right so on the road it wears tires puts load on your driveline what does it do on the sand 
doesn't where your tiles will load up your drive line it just digs right so you sort of you start digging in a bit so no lockers for sand generally don't get me wrong there's some if you've got a nice straight sand dune and someone's been sitting there digging and digging and digging then you're going to get to parts where like we said your left front's in the end your right rear then, and you come to a stop because you didn't have your locker or you don't have your lockers on but does that mean you need a locker? No. Or does that mean you need to gently back up? As you roll gently down the track, keep it straight, you're going to sort of pave the way and flatten the track out because it's just sand, remember? And that's why in another video we showed you the shovel. You need your shovel. So you get out with your shovel and you get a bit of that sand and throw it in the hole there. And then you just go again. And it might not work that time, but you might get up. And if not, every time you roll backwards on, it's kind of flattening it out and smoothing out that track so that each time you go up, you can get a little bit more momentum. Do that, gain your experience doing it that way. You don't need to make it at a million miles an hour the first time, flying in the air, wheel spinning, and break something or end off the, off the side of a sand dune or something like that, right? So stop, take a look at it, have a think about it is the way to drive. Not a driving lesson here, it's about whether you need lockers or not, right? So I hope you get my picture. All the rough terrain, all the hard tracks around Melbourne, where you go and pick the hardest tracks, of course, that's where a locker's gonna help you. So if you're gonna do that, if you're a playboy and you're going to go to, you know, places like there's another place up here, Pyrenees over there. Yeah, there you go. I said it. Lucky if you kept watching. And over here, um, Cobor, you know, you can go to Cobor. There's quite, go up Elkhorn's track, you know, it's quite rough. You know, good place to wreck a Prado, wreck the underbody. Make sure you hit up Conan first for some bash plates, fuel tank guards, actuator guards, the whole lot. Shot guards, you're going to need full armor if you go up that one unless you're an extremely skillful, experienced driver and you got some crazy tyres and lift and all that sort of thing. And people do it, so awesome. I hope you get my picture though. Lockers are not needed. They will help if you like to play around these sorts of places, you know, um, up around um, Sydney here. What did I call this Sydney before anyway? You know, what do they call it? I can't remember the name of the tracks, you know, with a W in that area there. Um, you know, there's, there's some big rock steps. Look, if you've got the right tyres and you pick the right line, you'd probably make it up, but you know, a locker is certainly going to make it easier and a lot of people aren't going to make it without a locker. So, but that doesn't mean you need a locker. It means you need to think, should I be taking a Prado onto some of these tracks? So, bit of a general thing on how lockers work, which one's better. So in my opinion, the front on other vehicles, it may be different. Um, some vehicles, some older vehicles that perhaps don't, these vehicles don't have an LSD in the rear. Um, vehicles that have leaf springs in the rear so it's not flexing as much so perhaps it's better to get that rear locked before the front let's just put it out there the Hilux although it's leaf spring has got fairly good flex compared to an Amarok an Amarok's rubbish compared to a Hilux right and I've driven both the vehicles up the same tracks done a bit of testing with those that's probably why the Amarok came with that button for the rear locker standard because we needed it you know to drive up what you'd drive up in any standard Prado or Hilux this Amarok was going backwards again, again, anyway. Put that button on there. Oh, that worked. Oh, maybe that's why they put it there. So the point I'm trying to... I'm not hanging on Amaroks, although they probably deserve it, but we're not doing that. Um, the idea is think about it, right? Because remember, we explained how the front's better. That's because the rear's got coil springs, flex, and LSD. But remember, that's where the weight is. So if you haven't got coil springs, if you haven't got flex and you haven't got LSD then that's where your rear lock is probably going to be more of an advantage, right? Um, once again, not promoting or unpromoting ARB or any other brands or the e-lockers or whatever. People love the e-lockers. They come in some OEM vehicle standard. It's electric. Uh, my research, when I inquired about those with opposite lock, they explained the warranty process was we get you to keep your old diff centers and that and if there's a problem then you come back in we take the locker out we put your diff back in so you're on the road and then it gets sent away so they can assess whether it's a manufacturing fault or not which made me a bit nervous because well, that sounds like a lot of muck around you're going to put it in and then it muck plays up and then you're going to take it out put mine back in send it away then they may or may not it makes me nervous that they're not going to prove it if you've got to do that or they're going to take a long time they're going to come back again and get their locker put back in again how many times is that going to happen Anyway, didn't sound good to me. ARB said, hey, we've got a five-year warranty. I went, oh. And then I thought, well, there's ARBs everywhere. If there's a problem, they've got to sort it. So my locker was supplied and fitted by ARB for the warranty, five years, and I haven't had a problem. 
just my experience though, it's only one person. Look, we know of a few other cars, as I said, but when I want to be clear, I'm not telling you to buy one of those or not. I'm not saying you need a locker. People ask a few things like that, and I think we've covered the answer to the question. And generally, if a few people ask, there's a whole lot more people that were thinking or wondering the same thing. So, like always, thanks for watching. I hope you found it awesome. Give us the thumbs up, subscribe, hit the bell so the next important information you don't miss it, you know, coming your way. Thanks for watching. Bada bing, bada boom. Boom.